Welcome to the uh, Venture Capital Seminar. Uh, this is going to be very interesting because uh, I've spoken to most of the speakers and it seems like 100% of them are looking for money. Well, these are the guys who know how to get money and know how to give you money, uh, whether it's brain emulation, electric cars, or nanotech, or the, the most pressing issue of the day, a dog-cat recognition computer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, these are the guys who know how to find it. Uh, by the way, I'm Bob Bassani. I'm the stocks reporter for CNBC, and I've had a long-term interest in, in GNR. I want to introduce you to, to a couple of these guys. You know Peter already. Uh, David Rose is the founder and chairman of the New York Angels uh, a Venture Capital Organization. He's also with Rose Tech Ventures, a venture capital fund. He's going to tell us a little bit about AngelSoft and the ability to try to hook up people who are looking for money, entrepreneurs, with people who have money, like people here and what you people are out there. Mark Gorenberg is uh, with Hummer Winblatt Venture Partners. He's been with them for a long time. He's had a very high success rate bringing companies uh, into the, uh, bringing out public uh, companies into startup ventures and public software companies and uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about that. And you know Peter uh, from everywhere from from PayPal to uh, Facebook to Yelp and LinkedIn and now, of course, uh, Palantir. I hope will tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, Peter's had his fingers on very important early stage developmental technology. So what we've said here is we want to know about the next five to ten years. We don't want to do Twitter and we don't want to do the singularity. Venture capital guys tend to think five years from now, maybe as much as ten years from now. We've asked them to concentrate in that area, 2015 to 2020. So let me just start, Mark, with you and say, um, Tell us what excites you right now. What kind, of, what kind of projects, what kind of ventures are you looking into right now that you think will be viable in the next five years? Well, Bob, th Bob thank you. And uh, I wanted to thank uh, Michael Vassar for the opportunity to be here. And um, I also wanted to say, Bob's right, we won't talk about Twitter, but I know a lot of you are tweeting, so I hope you'll be kind to us on this panel. Um, we, uh, there are two things I, I think that really excite us and always excite us, which is disruption. And that's what venture capitalists live for, and uh, acceleration of technology. And, and what I find very uh, interesting is that um, I actually sit on the board of trustees at MIT with, with Ray Kurzweil, who's done phenomenal things, by the way, for MIT over the years and continues to today. But I learned about uh, Ray's work actually through a presentation by Steve Jurvetson, who is a venture capitalist with Draper Fisher that norm nominally includes the slides on the acceleration of technology in his presentation in explaining venture capital. So uh, you know, sort of the continuum of that. In terms of, I think, what really excites us in the software area today, which is what we invest in, are really, I think, three big trends. Um, we can talk more about them uh, through the questions. One is the digital consumer. Um, and clearly, Peter can talk best about this through uh, his work with Facebook, because they're really a leader today. But the whole notion of social networking collaboration, video explosion, mobile computing, Second one in globalization, I mean, this has been unprecedented uptake in the rest of the world, particularly in the emerging markets of the world over the last few years, where they're actually overtaking now the developing world in terms of number of internet users, and certainly even more so number of mobile users. And the third one from a perspective uh, close to us is, we think the biggest IT trend of the decade is uh, cloud computing, it's really a combination of a number of uh, technologies that's going to allow us to have many more users, many more uses, and solve a lot of the storage issues where storage has been growing 62% a year. And in fact, I think this year the internet's going to pass one, I think, what's a zettabyte? Is that a, a million terabytes or something? It's a big number. So we have to figure out how we're going to deal with all that. Cloud computing looks like something for the next five or 10 years that will really help with that. David? Uh, I'd come at it uh, at exactly the same points as Mark, and I'll phrase it in a little different way. Um, what really excites me over the next midterm horizon is the production of intangible goods um, and products as generated through crowdsourced um, production uh, by, uh, en enabled by universal communications. And so if you apply that against what Mark just said, you're talking whether it's social networking or, or social you know, group networking, group working, crowdsourcing. You're talking about globalization of communications so that anybody anywhere in the world can contribute to this. You're talking about cloud computing, which provides the infrastructure and hosting for it. Um, so I, I think that is here and now we have an infrastructure that today um, can enable an extraordinary amount. If you look at the things that, that Peter did, I mean, look at things like PayPal, 
Look at things like Facebook. Look at things like Yelp. These are all intangible. You're not talking about physical dollars moving around. You're talking about bits representing money. You're talking about lots of people, really, really scalable, based on, on cloud-based systems. So I think that's where the near-term future is. Peter? Well, the, you know, the things uh, that we sort of internally thought of um, at Founders Fund, our, our venture capital firm, um, are, are sort of the um, what are the next breakthrough areas of science and, and sort of what we've sort of come back to are um, all the uh, science fiction of the 50s and 60s and sort of where that stopped. And so it's basically space, it is uh, development of the oceans, development of outer space, development of um, uh, of artificial intelligence, um, next generation biotech, robotics, um, a variety of things like that. They are extremely unfashionable. Nobody's investing in them. And, um, and so while uh, it's, it's possible that we're still too early, uh, we think that, uh, that uh, if it turns out that they're right, we will be the only people who will invest and we will make an unbelievable amount of money. <laughs> and so, um, and so that's sort of uh, that's sort of where uh, where we've been focusing on. Um, you know, just one um, one uh, illustration is a company uh, we invested in a few uh, a year ago. Is uh, started by one of the uh, people who's uh, involved in pay, uh, PayPal or on um, SpaceX, a rocket company in Southern California. Um, and basically, the idea was there's been no new rocket company in the U.S. for 40 years. Maybe there's a way to build them much cheaper, much more efficiently. And so it's a, it's a way of going back to some technologies, improving them dramatically. Um, and, um, and it looks like it's, it looks like it's working. And what's, what's remarkable is that it was the sort of thing nobody was really interested in investing in. And as, an, as an investor, I, I'm always focused on sort of what's, what I think is both fundamental and very contrarian. You know, one of the things, uh, talking to the entrepreneurs, and let's face it, you, most of you are entrepreneurs in one way or another here, uh, was how difficult it is between, to get the idea into an execution stage. And that's where a lot of great ideas fail. It's not that the ideas are bad, they, don't, they can't execute. And usually that means not hooking up with the right people. Uh, David, how do you sort of shrink that disconnect between the entrepreneur and the investor like you? How, how do you get people out here who have all of these great ideas to understand a little bit more the process of, of bringing a, a, a company fully to fruition. It, it's really challenging, as I'm sure my fellow panelists would agree. One of the biggest problems that we have is a complete disconnect between investors and entrepreneurs who are looking at the world from very, very different perspectives. Uh, and and the, the part of the challenge is you hear stories about people like, like Peter, and you hear, you hear the story of PayPal, and you hear Facebook, and everybody is convinced that their new venture is, of course, the next PayPal or Facebook or MySpace or whatever. Um, and therefore, in their own minds, they've projected out the economics and the, the, the time to market and the success. Um, whereas from our perspective as investors, uh, looking at portfolio theory, and as Peter pointed out, you know, the number of venture capital firms that have actually returned a profit in the last decade has been very, very uh, relatively small. Um, so the problem is with aligning the expectations of, of both sides uh, so that um, entrepreneurs can understand how we view it as investors, the whole risk-reward ratio in the long-term investment. So, so, Mark, maybe the idea should be that investors should learn how to take money, not so they can just spend the money, but to learn how to build a company, for example. Well, there is, there is, we do like to think, I mean, I guess all venture capitalists have egos, we do like to think that we're worth more than money. And we like to think that the reason why you actually work with venture capitalists is not so much for the investment, although clearly that's something that we do bring to the table, but the pattern matching that you know, we see over time in terms of building companies. Um, I would say that um, it's never too early to come see us. It may be too early from a market standpoint to be a venture investment, but in the period of time between when you're sitting with the idea and when the market inflects, it's a good time just not to spend a lot of money. That's a good time to basically um, hunker down, understand where the market is going, perhaps take a little bit of money, uh, and get ready for the next risk reduction point. And when the market is really turning up the curve, that's when you'd really want to take a lot of money in. However, I think all of us have seen the movie a number of times that even in that early stage, we can be a helpful advisor in terms of how to build the company and what to do, what not to do, Perhaps more than that, introduce you to a lot of other people who have built companies. So it's not us talking to you, but our networks 
of people that I think you'll find to be pretty smart people. And, and Peter, that goes to that whole issue of timing that Mark was, was bringing up, that, that there are cycles of investing and there are stages where people make money as investors and stages where they don't make money. There's that famous story, Mark, uh, and maybe you can tell us about about Federal Express, where the first okay. five or six investors, big investors in Federal Express, never made any money. It was the seventh investor that came in that really made the big money. So Peter, maybe you can tell us a little bit or discuss the idea of the, the timing right and when to get the money in. Well, uh, you know, I, I, tend to, I tend to focus uh, very heavily on um, the, t the, the people and the, the teams of people. I think that, uh, you know, most successful companies require more than one person and it is uh, and typically uh, the scenarios where they go wrong is one where the people don't like each other and they have a shootout at the ranch mm -hmm. and the yeah. company blows up internally. And we always yeah. have this sort of Darwinist metaphor that you know companies are competing in this ecosystem but actually they're not unitary, they're composite holes and they're made up of the people that constitute the companies and it's very very important to figure out you know how they will uh, how they will uh, get along. Uh, one of the uh, businesses I'm involved in, uh, Palantir Technologies, I think, has uh, done a phenomenal job on this particular dimension using social networking. They basically identify, you know, which people are likely to get along with what other people in the company, um, and uh, and model it very precisely that way. And so basically, when you have people interview at Palantir, we um, we figure out which of the 200 people in the company, what are the five people that you have the most in common with. We, those are the people we have you interview with, and then um, almost everybody ends up accepting an offer since it's like it seems like the coolest place ever. So I think I think there are, you know, so I think I think I think there are dimensions like that that are uh, that are really important to uh, to uh, to uh, zero in on. In terms of the question of timing on uh, on uh, on capital, uh, my my own bias is that uh, you know is that uh, um, you know we, we um, is that we've probably been a bit too much in a world of uh, value investing o over the last mm -hmm. uh, decade where uh, you know the icon has been Warren Buffett where you invest in Dairy Queen and Seize Candies and it's sort of companies that are profitable and making money and uh, what we should be at the margins pushing a little bit more is companies that are um, that are uh, losing money and they're gonna lose money for a long time because those are the ones that I think are the most undervalued. And so I, uh, I like to invest in companies that uh, expect to lose money for a long time. So, so Dave, <laughs> so Dave. But, but not a lot of money. Not, but not a lot of money. anti buffett yeah, strategy. But, so David, uh, t there are people out here who have ideas, who spent a lot of time and effort investing in, in ideas that they think might have some kind of future as, as a business. How do you find a way to hook up those people with people who are in similar areas who are looking to invest. And maybe you could tell us something about AngelSoft, which is, I, I sure. think, an interesting the, idea. The, well, first of all, the best way to get to any of us is to network. If we know somebody in common, and that person knows what we're looking for, and that person knows about you, that person can make an introduction and help cut through the clutter. Um, failing that, you can approach, just walk up to us after the, the panel and, and, and talk. That's at least something. Um, but if you look sort of towards Singularityville and in the future, um, and you look at all the people who are entrepreneurs or could be entrepreneurs in the world, you have a you know, 10 billion population, what percentage could be entrepreneurs? You know, deca, you know, deca millions of that. Um, and ultimately, if you look at distributed capital, again, looking toward the future, where there aren't just you know, 200 or 300 VC funds, um, where there are individual people, whether they're angel investors or people who could help to, to fund this innovation, you know, that's an interesting challenge. So I look at that, I, I run New York Angels, which is the largest angel group here in New York, uh, on a very, very small scale doing that kind of thing. Um, and so I started a company called AngelSoft, which, whose, whose goal is to try and help organize and, and use cloud computing and use the idea of, of an internet infra infrastructure to bring together are all of these angel groups. And so right now, virtually every angel group in the world uses our software to help process incoming deals from entrepreneurs. So we're processing over 3,000 business plans a month to 20,000 investors in 45 countries. Um, and as Peter said, you know, we're, start, we're currently losing money, but hopefully this is building a company for a future in some number of years, 3, 5, 10, 15, whenever, when you really have this crowdsourced capital, crowdsourced entrepreneurship, and you use technology to bring it together. And one of the things that's very important about about, uh, angel investing and venture capital investing is it's a lot cheaper to help start up a company now than it was 20 years 
ago, sure. for example, where you want, might have needed $20 million today. Give us some examples of companies. Absolutely. How much my, my, my first internet company, pre-bubble, pre, you know, in the very early days of the, of the 90s, pre when the internet was starting, took 20 million bucks in venture capital to get to internet product ship. My second internet company took only 2 million bucks in VC to get to uh, internet product ship. And then after the crash, and <clears throat> uh, my wife said no more starting companies, so I became an investor. Uh, <laughs> so the first company I invested in as an angel took only 200,000 bucks to get to internet product ship. And then last year, New York Angels, uh, our group here in, in the city, invested in a really cool company um, in the video stock footage space. They came to us with a full management team, fully operating uh, system, generating revenue, and the total dollars that they had invested to that date is $20,000. 20 million, 2 million, 200,000, 20,000. So the, the, the There's a Ray are, Kurzweil uh, chart for you. <laughs> I, I have to, I actually don't, don't entirely agree with this. I'm going to sort of try to uh, descend a little bit here. I, I think that, uh, you know, I think there are certainly many areas where you can start companies much more cheaply, but the, the counterpoint to this is that the cheaper it is to start a company, the, more bar um, the fewer barriers to entry there are. Absolutely. And so, um, you know, so if it costs you only $20,000 to start a company, there may be 10,000 other people who are planning to start a company just like that, and it's like, a, it's like you know, trying to open a Chinese food restaurant or something like that, which again, doesn't cost very much, but um, isn't a great business to be in. And so I, I, I do wonder whether um, sort of uh, monopoly technology companies or, uh, if you want to make it slightly more euphemistic, uh, companies with positive network externalities or really valuable technology that people are willing to pay a lot for that have a big advantage over the next best competitor, um, I, I wonder whether a lot of them still have the attribute that they cost uh, they, they will require in the millions to the tens of millions until they get to a point where, uh, where they're cash flow positive. Well, a, a counterpoint on that, and, I, and I, by the way, I, I agree with what you're saying. However, if you have a low cost of entry and low barriers to entry, you then have a very Darwinian uh, you know, capitalistic world where the ones who can really execute, and I think we'd all agree that execution is, is the key as opposed to just an idea, the ones that execute well are the ones that will grow in, in this forest and, and succeed. So you could look at it both ways. Yeah, I don't like the aesthetics of Darwinism. I prefer just... Uh, just uh, Guaranteed survival. I want to just own the idea. <laughs> <laughs> I want to just own the idea outright. Thank you, uh, Mark. Tell us a little bit about how uh, people, how people can understand uh, how a venture capitalist thinks uh, in terms of the life cycle of of the product itself. Uh, explain how people, you can talk to people and say this idea is not ready for the next five years for investing, but here's what you need to do in that time period. Or yes, this is. Explain your thinking okay. and how this works. I, oh, well, first of all, I think um, we're looking at something that's much more in the horizon of, let's say, zero to five years to start to get some uptake, maybe five to ten years to be a relatively good-sized company. Um, in the thought process of that, um, you're really looking at market timing. So you start off by looking at, you know, essentially market, market, market. Where is the market going to start to adopt this? And it could be that you have no customers today, and that's fine, and most of the things we invest in are, are pre-revenue. But we pro probably go out and talk with some folks and say, what do you think? If they build this, if it's available in the next half year or a year, is this something that you might buy? Is this something that you can see using? Is this something you're trying to do right now on your own with chicken wire and glue, that if you had a real product that you'd be interested in? So we start off by sort of canvassing the market and looking at the market. Uh, you know, after that, of course, we look at the people. Um, we look for excellence over experience. We look actually to see if, if you can attract more excellence. We tend to ask, do people we know, will they come and work with you? And that's usually a good barometer for, for that point. Uh, and of course we look at the product or, or the early stage of the product that you're building. Um, and um, again, I think um, the other point of this is positioning. You know, have you focused this? Is it sort of crisp enough that you can get an entry into the market? Because um, startups want to be disruptive, but you're also looking for that entry point where you can get into the market before you turn up to a much larger solution. And sometimes one of the biggest um, um, mistakes of an early company is they try to do too much too early. And therefore, that not only is it, it takes a lot of engineering work, but um, it takes a much, it's a much harder positioning issue to figure out how to get into the market. And of course, we also look at leverage which is, are there ways that you can get leverage out of what you're doing and will other people sort of help you 
in that process. And I think those are some of the things we but, can But part of the challenge with singularity-focused businesses, if you're talking about, you know, losing money, losing money, losing money, losing money, losing money, losing money, 10 years, and then making a billion dollars, mm -hmm. that's a very difficult kind of play for a outside capital to support. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, if you can show as you get going along the way that either you can begin to you, you somehow create value, either value in terms of, of real revenues and, and baseline profitability so you can keep functioning in, in case of bad times, or else very clear, demonstrative to the outside world, real value in the enterprise, a la Twitter, for example, um, even though you're not generating current revenues. Um, that's the kind of thing that people like to finance. Uh, I'm going to ask one last question, then we'll open it up to some questions here. How, how, does, um, how does a VC guy deal with the singularity? I mean, once you're aware of it, does it change the way you invest, for example? Is there a, 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 a hole that's out there that does, does not exist now, but that's going to exist at some point in the future? Does, do you ever think about this? Uh, I, I think we're all really bullish on technology. I mean, I think the one clear thing you'll hear from the entire venture community is that, uh, and this is somewhat congruent with, uh, with, with Peter's talk before, if technology does not advance, we're out of business. And so there's a strong importance to the venture community that technology keep advancing. Again, we look for disruption, we look for innovation, because that's the only way that small companies can compete with large companies. So by definition, we're sort of believers in this curve. Now, I will also say that um, uh, venture people in general tend to look at a much shorter term horizon. Yeah. So, or maybe to say, I don't want to talk for, for, my, for my associates, but for myself, I would say I'm very in awe of the smarts of this room because you're able to really look out that far. I, I tend to look out in the next 10 years and probably the singularity is not gonna happen in the next 10 years. So it's just to say, when you get within about 10 years of the singularity, I think that's when most of the venture community will wake <laughs> up and say, whoa, something's really happening here. In the meantime, we're all just trying to figure out what's in front of us and build on top of the disruptions and just keep going. Anything you wanna say? Or well, I, I, you know, I, I think that, uh, I, I do think that, uh, it's, 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 um, it's not exactly predictable when this is going to happen. Um, it is, it is uh, one, one, of the, you know, we, one of the things that is striking to me is that I think um, the venture capital community as a whole are not, uh, is, 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 is slightly too short-term focused, as is you know, much of the rest of uh, the U.S. In, in many other ways, and is slightly too focused on businesses that will quickly make money Prove value, and um, and uh, and not willing to take long-term flies. Now, there obviously, are sectors where this has been bad. So, you know, biotech. Mm -hmm. I think for the last 30 years, nobody's made any money in biotech, mm -hmm. and it's like been a disaster. Um, but uh, maybe this is a good time to look at biotech because there aren't very many people investing in it anymore. And so, I I, I do think uh, it's it's a very good time to think about uh, some of the technologies that will drive the singularity as an investor because there aren't very many investors that are doing this, and I think it's a good time as an entrepreneur because there aren't that many entrepreneurs doing it either. I, I share your sentiment on biotech for sure. Good. Quick. I, 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 I think the, the, the challenge here is that we all are obviously technologically focused. We're sitting on a panel at the Singularity Summit here, so we clearly all buy into this. The problem is the disconnect between where the money comes from, from either limited partners or your own pocket, that needs to get a return, a risk-adjusted return, over a relatively near, t near term. And it's very hard to invest in almost pure research or things that will pop out in 15 or 20 years there, given the risk and the, and the time value of money. We've got five minutes for some questions. Yes, sir. All oh, right. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong or if you have a differing opinion, but it seems to me like there's somewhat of a lack of uh, people who have the experience with executing, the network of people who also know how to execute, along with the venture capital in their bank account because of the previous companies they've done, uh, coupled with the long-term determination of making something happen. It seems like there aren't too many people doing that, but there's a lot of billionaires, there's a lot of multimillionaires out there who know how to do things. And for, uh, so personally, I, I joined SpaceX uh, because of Elon Musk's mm -hmm. vision and mm -hmm. essentially his determination. And I think that attracts a lot of people mm -hmm. to anyone who's doing that. Mm -hmm. So, any thought? It's not really a question, but any thoughts? Uh, well, mm -hmm. I, th I, you know, I don't want to go into a sweeping sociological critique, but I, I, do, th I do think, but uh, with that as a caveat, let me do that. Um, <laughs> I, um, I, well, hold on. <laughs> um, I, I, th I think that, um, 
you know, I think there is a, uh, there is a very weird disconnect between um, a lot of people have accumulated money in technology, but they are not thinking of putting the money back into tech, either as investors or even in, in a sort of philanthropic, longer-term thing. And I, what, I, what I would like to see is, is that is, as a priority. Uh, and so if you, you know, that, you know, for every dollar that goes to the opera or the art museum, I'd like to see a dollar go towards, um, towards I think, technology. I think we all feel that way. Either for-profit, non-profit, mm -hmm. either way. Uh, absolutely. absolutely. Let me get some more questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, so I like the emphasis on longer-term investing because I, I mean, the company I helped found uh, was lost money for seven years before becoming significantly profitable. But anyway, the, my question is about the areas of technology that you did not pick. You were asked at the beginning, where do you personally see lots of excitement and you didn't say anything about artificial intelligence companies, you didn't say anything about companies to augment intelligence through various smart mobile devices, uh, intelligent augmentation or even augmented reality in which uh, people can use these as uh, mirrors to the world and make much more sense out of them, things that would make people smarter. So don't you believe in the potential of this when it comes to putting your, putting your money in or is this just too, too small fry? Oh. No, I think, that's, I think that's a very fair comment. And um, obviously the trends that we talked about were very high and very broad brush. But, you know, if you went down trends to the next level, you know, it's a software as a service, virtualization, open source, artificial intelligence, um, consumer infrastructure, security compliance, analytics. So there's a whole series, but I thought the panel was probably too short to try to go that level. I, I do want to talk about one place, if, if I can, um, and goes back to Peter's comment about giving back. Um, one thing that, that I'm personally supporting is the Desponde Center at MIT, which is probably the leading place now in universities to take work from the lab into the marketplace. They uh, look at, they've looked at 400 proposals now by professors at MIT uh, since they started in 2002. They funded 81 projects with grants of 50 to 250 thousand dollars, and 20 of those companies have now spun out, have become companies, spun out and are venture-backed in the Boston area. And that's in different areas that we don't invest, biotech, nanotech, And just, just, just one quick, quick sentence right, right along these lines. I think the even bigger problem is not at the university or graduate level, it's at the elementary level. In terms of science, technology, engineering, and math education in America, it is a total disgrace. And I think anything anybody here can do to help Great. with that, whether it is tutoring or volunteering or giving or donating um, or, or just making people aware of the real crisis we have in early stage education in, in technology, that would be one of the best things you can do to help the singularity get here Absolutely. faster. We're, we're running out of time. Agreed. Good boy. One more question we have time for, uh, sir. Have you seen any instances where like uh, venture capital money is, uh, is kind of lacking now due to the economic conditions? Because I've read a couple of times like VCs uh, like sometimes pull out of companies or like now people are trying to do startups are having a tough time getting funding and they have to turn to their families and friends like, like that then wasn't the instance before. But now it's just a lot more tougher to get the money to, you know, do a startup. Um. The, uh, it, it's sort of an interesting time for venture firms whether you actually have money to invest or whether you don't if you're looking at it from the venture model. And um, we're very fortunate that we raised a fund before this all started. We won't have to raise our next fund until afterwards. So we have lots of money to invest and are actively looking for opportunities. But there are a lot of venture firms that are spending all their time right now looking to raise their next fund because they're caught in this downturn of the end of last year, which is that as endowments went way down, they could not take on new venture commitments. And so the first question you should ask any venture firm when you meet with them is, do you have money to invest right now? Good point. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, I think uh, it's, it's obviously impacted some by the whole economic downturn. It's probably less so than a lot of, lot of other stuff. Um, you know, I think one of the challenges people have in talking to venture capitalists is that it's, uh, it's often, I think, um, not that easy to get a straight answer on sort of why they're not giving you money. And, um, yeah. and so it's sort of like, uh, I don't know, it's sort of like, uh, this is too extreme, but it's like, you know, if you're shopping a screenplay in Hollywood and everyone tells you, oh, it's the greatest screenplay ever and you're so brilliant and you're just going to be famous, but of course, you know, I'm not going to give you any money for it. And, um, and so in some sense, you know that a VC likes your company if they write you a check. And then if they tell you it's a great company, but they're not quite ready to write you a check, 
Um, maybe it's that, or maybe it's still very, very far off. And I think, uh, I think there is a systemic skew that's, you know, we, we try to give people very direct and honest feedback, but you know, the, the bias is always to be a little bit, um, you know, not to tell people like, nice, your company just sucks, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we're going to have to go. I hope we've shed some light on a very complicated process. Mark, David, and Peter will be here. Don't let a great idea die. Thank you. <laughs>